Welcome to the 10th Data, AI and Society seminar. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognising their continuing connection to land, waters and sky. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So we're so pleased with how this seminar has been going with the incredible scholars we've been able to bring to this time zone. Um, and I hope that the discussions we've started here will continue as we try to find ways to forge democratically legitimate data and AI systems. And on this, our 10th seminar, a bit of a landmark moment, um, I'm thrilled to welcome Marietta Bebe, uh, an inspirational scholar from now, um, well, from heading to Berkeley uh, via, at the moment, the Harvard Society of Fellows and to complete the sort of distinguished roundup of institutions, a PhD in Cornell. Uh, her PhD was awarded the ACM Knowledge Discovery and Data, Data Mining Award. Um, she's the co-founder of the important organization Black and AI. Um, and her talk is going to be on um, roles for computing in social justice. So, Radiet, if you'd like to share your screen, you'll have about 30 minutes for your talk. Um, and then we'll go on to questions. So thanks so much for oh, being here. 30 minutes for my talk. Okay. All right. We'll do we'll do 30 minutes then. Um, let me just make sure that you can. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen and just confirming that it's advancing. Yep. Yes. Okay, very good. All right. Thanks uh, for confirming that. Thank you so much for um, the organizers of the seminar for inviting me. It's uh, a lot of, it sounds like a lot of my friends have spoken in the seminar, actually. So it's going to be, I'm sure, a very tough act to follow, but I'm very happy to be sharing some of this work with you all. So um, I'll just get started. Um, so in many ways, uh, as you know, in many ways, the world looks very different than it did several years ago, even a year ago, even a couple of months ago, um, at least here in the US, um, we have um, millions of people who have been infected by the COVID virus, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who've died because of it. Um, and this figure that you see here is from several weeks ago. And so I'm sure it's like severely outdated, right? This is a very ongoing um, issue that we have in the US. Um, and in the US also, we're uh, dealing with a lot of police violence and um, sort of attacks on immigrants has sort of reached uh, a breaking point, right? So we have this kind of like a lot of uh, things that are happening at the same time. And they're also kind of uh, intersecting with one another in sort of unsustainable and crushing ways. So if you look at the pandemic, for instance, um, we know that Black Americans um, and American Indians and uh, Hispanic and Latino people are three to five times as likely to be infected by the virus, to be hospitalized and to, to die from this virus. Um, and likewise, U.S. immigrants, which constitute a large portion of our essential workforce, are left out, entirely left out of programs aimed at assisting families in these um, incredibly desperate times. And so you might ask, what are we going to do about this? And if you, like me, are trained um, in computer science uh, and you have techniques uh, in data science and algorithms and optimization and these kind of constellation of techniques that you are trained in and are excited about, you might want to use those skills to try to alleviate some of these issues that I've mentioned and the many others that uh, predate these uh, particular uh, examples that I've given to you. But of course, here we've seen attempts to use algorithmic techniques um, really uh, to try to support society really backfire. We now have endless and endless of examples where algorithms that were meant to increase efficiency or remove human bias or whatever it is that we wanted to do actually sort of um, ossify and exas exacerbate um, existing biases or discrimination or um, inequality that we have. And even algorithms that were designed with vulnerable communities in mind um, can really uh, also sort of backfire. And this is covered by the work of Virginia Eubanks in automating inequality among many other places that you might uh, that you might know of. And of course, this crowd uh, knows that there are many different pitfalls for using computing for social good. Um, sort of three, uh, the three categories that I would put these pitfalls in are uh, solutionism, which you've heard, right? This is a tendency to assume that uh, computational techniques will solve our social problems. There's a sort of tinkering that happens, right? Where we take a lot of problematic uh, social political systems as being fixed. Uh, we just assume that they're given and we sort of try to optimize around them. And there's a, there's a sort of diversion that happens also, right? Where we get so fixated on a particular type of problem or computational set of techniques that we get distracted from the root of the problem and what other forms of um, addressing these problems there might be out there. So, you know, all of this kind of gives, gives one pause. It gave me pause when I was a PhD student. Uh, you know, there was at some point I was like, should we just kind of throw out all of our techniques and maybe just like, 
become, you know, sociologists or some other discipline that maybe uh, that maybe is useful. And if this was a really a genuine question that I was asking myself, is a genuine question that my uh, uh, that my colleagues at Cornell were we were having these conversations uh, because we had these set of techniques that we like, but we also saw these deep rooted social problems, and we wanted to help make progress towards those. And so what happened was we had you know several conversations over a period of several years actually that eventually led to this paper that kind of uh, uh, synthesizes a lot of what what we think um, uh, uh, gives some evidence to computing being a constructive ally to bringing about um, meaningful social changes, not sort of minor ones, but sort of meaningful social changes that we think uh, will move things in the right direction. So this is uh, joint work with the collaborators that you see there, most of whom are still at Cornell um, and are uh, amazing scholars whose work you should follow. So in this work, uh, what we started with is the premise that social change is really the work of many hands, right? So uh, it's not going to be computing that's going to solve everything, but it could play a role in uh, by working in harmony with other activities to kind of make progress towards things that are um, that are important. So uh, we had, uh, I'm not going to cover everything in the interest of time, but we had sort of a framework uh, through which we were thinking about this. I'll give you a sort of sampling of some of the roles that we identified computing can play uh, towards this goal. One of these is the role of computing as a diagnostic. So this is one that kind of comes very naturally to us, right? It's, it says that there's these social problems out there and maybe we're not gonna solve them, but just understanding them and sort of the mechanisms that perpetuate them can itself play an important role. So especially when these social problems are manifesting themselves in technical systems, measuring and precisely characterizing these problems, problems itself can play a very important role. So think, you know, just as an example, think back to some of your favorite works in this area. So one that comes immediately to mind for many people is the work of uh, Professor Latanya Sweeney, uh, a computer scientist and political scientist at Harvard, who has this paper from 2013, which you know, in computer science years is like a century ago, right? She has this paper from 2013 that shows that um, when you search for names of, um, of individual, of African-American, uh, names commonly associated with African-American individuals, you're more likely to see ads that are, um, let's say, arrest-related or um, uh, sort of defaulting on loans and things like that, right? Sort of things that are associated with um, kind of a negative socioeconomic standing. You're more likely to see that. You see, as an example, uh, just the name of, uh, of the, the author itself, Natanya Sweeney, right? Uh, the author herself, Natanya Sweeney. And really, this is not the only work that sort of that has this kind of diagnostic flavor. If you think back to other work that you've seen, uh, work on facial uh, recognition technologies, facial analysis technologies, work, work on um, bias in word embedding, racial bias in healthcare algorithms, there are all these different examples that you can think of. And many of these are not necessarily um, introducing a solution per se, they're sort of just measuring and, and characterizing the extent of a problem uh, in these particular cases as they're manifesting in various technical systems. So just to give you an example from my own work, uh, this is work that I did with colleagues um, at Microsoft Research and Stony Brook University um, a couple of years back. Uh, what we were doing here was we were really interested in this idea of data inequalities, right, which is that there's groups of individuals that are not adequately represented in data sets, they might be misrepresented in data sets, right? And that really kind of inhibits our ability to make interventions to, uh, to support these communities. So if you're thinking about health, um, HIV AIDS, for instance, uh, within the African continent, we know that um, there's just very little data that we have. So even things like death certificates of individuals tend to contain a lot of really serious errors that make them essentially unusable. And so if you're trying to think about, let's say, what information are people seeking? That's very nuanced information. You're not going to get that data, right? And so we're in this position where we have so little information about what information, what knowledge people have, what knowledge they're lacking, what misinformation might be out there that we can't adequately target um, educational uh, interventions and sort of information-based interventions to effectively combat the burden of this disease. And so what me and my colleagues wanted to do in the setting is to use search data as a way to kind of bridge some of this um, gap that exists, some of this inequality that exists in accessibility of high quality data on individuals across all 54 nations in Africa. 
So we specifically focused on people searches related to HIV and AIDS over a period of 18 months. And we were able to extract um, different topics in which people are interested. So some of these were things that you would expect uh, people asking about uh, symptoms and drugs and breastfeeding with HIV, but then other things that are um, we know are hard to, uh, to survey, right? So people asking about uh, stigma and discrimination. So these are individuals asking things like, can my boss fire me if I'm HIV positive? Um, also um, questions related to natural cures and remedies like does, you know, garlic or black, black seed oil or, you know, whatever, you know, herb you want to put in here, does that cure HIV and AIDS and does profit XYZ cure HIV and AIDS and things like that, right? And so these are things that are are just very well known to be very difficult to survey because the, it's a stigmatized condition and um, uh, people can't necessarily freely talk about it. And yet these questions are sort of in our data set. And so you can sort of, uh, here you're seeing the different kind of topics, right? These are sort of uh, the different topics that, that would emerge, but you can actually dig deeper, look at individual search queries as well that are representative to really get a sense of what's going on. So here you can see that related to natural cures and remedies, there are all sorts of questions that people are asking uh, that range from things that are known, like, you know, does Moringa, does Moringa uh, plant cure HIV? This, it's known that people think this and are, and are asking about this, but also others that are very common in our data set, but not necessarily known, like honeybee venom cures AIDS or chlorine dioxide cures HIV, right? So these are search queries that are very common in our data set but there wasn't necessarily an awareness by various ministries of health that this might be a question that people are, are asking. And so we've been able to use this to actually sort of support data collection efforts so that people uh, who are designing these surveys can, uh, can use some of these search data insights to ask uh, the right questions or improved questions when collecting surveys. But what we were really interested in was actually when someone asks a question, what result do they see? What, what does the search engine kind of get back to them as, as, a, as a response to their question? So if you asked uh, one of the most common searches that we saw, which is does garlic cure HIV? At the time, you can do this on Bing, which was what we used, but also Google, you know, pick your favorite search engine. Um, at the time, what you would see is that the top website that was highlighted is a website called miracleofgarlic.com. And it was a website that contained content that I, as a non-health expert, could immediately see contained a lot of um, ascientific information, right? So this is what, you, what one would see. And it's not even like the top website, it's actually highlighted as a sort of answer. And this happened, you know, a scary number of times. There were times when we found Yahoo Answers highlighted as an answer and things like that, right? So there's a really, um, uh, uh, there's, there's a real issue here. But in contrast, if you looked at, um, uh, let's say, antiretroviral drugs for HIV, then the web page looks very different. The top website is something that uh, was rated highly by the, we had RAs that evaluated the content of websites that had um, graduate level training in health and they rated this highly, but also actually the whole web page looks very different. On the right hand side, you see a Wikipedia page highlighted, you see um, uh, uh, suggested search queries about, let's say, table of antiretroviral drug interactions, things like that, right? So these are very different web pages that are being presented to people, depending on the topic with which their searches may be associated. And we were able to sort of work with uh, people who volunteer their time, uh, who have graduate level training in health and medicine to like evaluate the content of these searches of these web pages and they and we were able to find that searches associated with natural cures and remedies rated at about 1.5 out of 5 meaning that they had serious um, problems with uh, relevance objectivity and uh, and sort of accuracy by as measured by a health expert whereas other searches uh, related to stigma and breastfeeding and drugs rated at, at least four out of five um, at, at, at least four and up out of five right so this kind of shows as uh, one discrepancy that exists that existed in the search engine itself um, leaving to leaving people to walk away with different quality content even though you know it's the same person maybe sitting down asking top uh, questions that are uh, related to different topics 
And there's many different reasons why this might be happening, right? So there's a sort of like information ecosystem here that's worth thinking through, right? Someone sits down and they type a search, uh, they type a search query related to HIV and AIDS. The search engine pro does some sort of processing, and then it maps that search query to web pages. And what's returned to the person is a results page that has, you know, the top ten web pages that someone could click on, right? That's what would happen if you did this on Google or on Bing. And there's many different places where sort of uh, different uh, uh, disparities might creep in or bias might creep in. One of them is just what someone is typing themselves. Okay, there we have less control, so uh, we'll kind of leave that aside. The other place is the search engine itself, right? So one thing we found was that if you're typing for does garlic cure HIV, but you uh, have a typo in your search or there's something that you did that's like maybe the word ordering was not quite optimal or something, search engines do this sort of back end processing to correct that before they try to map the search, uh, the search, uh, the search query with web pages. And we found that they were doing this kind of back end processing significantly less for searches related to natural cures and remedies versus say stigma and discrimination. Right? So there's a sort of uh, bias that's creeping in in this back end processing by the search engines. And the second place where it was creeping in, and this was, I'll admit this was a, sh a shock to me, was that there's just not enough web pages from high authority websites that you could even present, right? So if you said, I wanna know, does garlic cure HIV, but I only wanna see web pages from like CDC, UNAIDS, NIH, WHO, then it could show you zero web pages. Maybe there's actually no web pages that it could show you that could be a potential um, contender for a search query related to uh, sort of natural cures and remedies. And so there's actually like, you know, something between four to seven times as many web pages available on uh, drugs and uh, antiretroviral drugs versus natural cures. Right. So when these web pages don't exist, then you know it doesn't matter what the web search, uh, what the search engine is doing. If these web pages are not out there, then there's nothing that you could map it to. And so this is an opportunity for high authority websites like the NIH or the WHO or UNAIDS or the CDC to step in and present um, uh, present uh, high quality content that otherwise would be filled in by sort of low quality blogs or sort of lower authority websites. So this was something that we were able to share with folks at the NIH. I won't go into it in the interest of time, but we'll step back again, think about the role of computing as a diagnostic. One thing that we really have to be careful of here is that this seems like a, an important role that it can play, but it's very easy to assume that just because we know the extent of problems, then kind of coming up with a solution is going to be uh, very immediate, right? That di the diagnosis of the problem is actually equal to treatment. We know this is absolutely not the case. Uh, here is a quote that I really like by Ruha Benjamin that says, data and, self, data and short do not speak for themselves and don't always change hearts uh, and minds and policy. So at least here in the US, uh, we know there are situations like um, problems like mass incarceration or uh, chronic homelessness where we really are very well aware of the extent of the problem, but we don't necessarily have sufficient consensus to address these problems. And so it's very important to recognize that just because we know the extent of a problem, it doesn't mean that the treatment is going to quickly follow because it could absolutely not. But of course, computing has also informed treatment, right? So if you're in the kind of mechanism design space or optimization space as I am, uh, you can immediately think of examples where, uh, uh, where computational folks have informed um, allocation of kidneys and seats in public schools and low-income housing resources and many different types of examples, right? This is a sort of treatment where we've played, as a community, we've played, we've played a role in kind of shaping how things are allocated for, for quite some time now. People have won, you know, Nobel Prizes over the, this kind of work. And so in this way, it's important to recognize that actually computing is serving as a sort of formalizer. What that means is that because sort of say algorithms or mechanism design or optimization, because it requires us to be very uh, unambiguous and very concrete about our inputs, about our goals, about our constraints, in a way it can actually sort of shape how social problems are understood, right? Um, and what I mean by this is that a lot of times when we have discussions about social problems, we say things like, you know, the social worker must act in the best interest of the child or housing assistance programs aim to help the most number of people. And this is something that we can kind of all like nod along and say, yes, this is important, right? 
but it's very ill-defined. What do we mean by the best interest of the child or even help the most number of people? These are kind of vague, um, vague things. And actually, you could mean any number of things as part of you know, the most number of people or the best interest of the child or the most qualified. And so in a way, what computing does is that because it forces you to translate these more ambiguous sentences that are very easy to agree to, and so a very concrete math problem, it actually gives you sort of like an opportune site for contestation, or it can be sort of like natural target for, uh, for advocacy. And um, just as an example from sort of my own work, one thing where, uh, one thing that we've been really interested in working on is problems related to housing assistance programs to alleviate um, uh, housing instability and eviction. And the US, again, where you might hear things like, we, you know, we wanna help the most number of people, but what we were able to find in this uh, in this work, where we focused on the role of income shocks in leading to uh, undesirable outcomes like eviction, uh, we had this model, and we were able to ask a set of sort of like interesting optimization questions. And what we were able to find in that work is that even in this very stylized setting, where we were asking very sort of like uh, an optimization problem that like kind of stripped away a lot of the complexity and was just really asking uh, sort of a set of very foundational questions, what we were able to find there was that even in that very stylized setting, you can result, you can, you can end up in these situations where uh, you're actually doing the opposite thing depending on, you know, one, you know, reasonable kind of setting versus a different one, right? Let's say if you're thinking about an optimization problem, the, this our optimization problem where your objective function is a min sum objective, which says I want to minimize the expected number of people that have uh, that experience eviction, right? So this is a sort of like you're trying to help as many people as possible sort of in expectation versus a min-max objective, which says, I'm gonna take the person who's like at the most risk of eviction and try to help them, right? So this is sort of raising the floor, whereas the other one is like trying to kind of like help the most number of people in expectation. What we found was that even in this setting where both of these objective functions seem reasonable, you could actually be targeting entirely disjoint sets of people. So one could say, you should focus on this set of individuals. Another can say, no, actually you should focus on, the, on these ones. Um, and that's the optimal thing to do, right? And so here, what we were able to show was that what information you're taking in about families really matters, the objective function really matters, the intervention type really matters, and maybe kind of optimally so. And so in that, in that sense, um, what we were able to, to argue was that a lot of times when we think about um, assistance programs, at least um, here in the US, it's very easy for us to say, well, you know, there's a lot of waste. Uh, we just don't know who to target. We haven't done it optimally. If only we could just be more efficient about it, then this problem would not be such a big deal, right? But here is a, you know, I'm kind of sweeping a lot of the details under the rug, but here's an example where we actually kind of optimally solve this problem in a lot of different settings. And it, it tells you to do very different things and sometimes the opposite thing. And so what that says is that maybe the problem here is not efficiency. Maybe the problem is that we just aren't investing enough in our, um, in our in our systems, in our kind of housing systems and housing stability systems. And so, you know, that kind of goes back to the point that um, in the US, a lot of people, something like three fourths of people who are who could actually be using a lot of assistance for housing actually just don't get it at all, right? So that's, you know, the vast majority of people are just not getting the assistance that they just assistance that they desperately need. And eviction was a huge problem even before this pandemic. And now we're sort of in this, uh, in, in this real crisis mode. And so in this way, this optimization question that I, I told you kind of provides further opportunity for us to say, look, you know, here is a concrete thing that I can show you and it's doing the opposite thing. And so, you know, quit talking about efficiency. Maybe this is about something else, right? So this is, gives us an, a natural opportunity for advocacy. And there's other roles for computing. I'm not gonna go into those, but I recommend that you look at the paper if you're interested in seeing the other, other points that we wanted to make here. But I want to close by highlighting kind of where we go from uh, from the point where we've written these papers, like the ones that I showed you from my own work, to actual kind of change, right? Because I think a lot of times as researchers, we it's very easy for us to assume that once we've written the paper and it's out there and we've given talks on it, as I have, our work here is done. But it really isn't. I think that that's something that sometimes gets lost in conversations. And in particular, one thing I'll add here is that um, we really have to embrace, especially as computer science people, we really have to em embrace uh, this responsibility that we have uh, to make sure that our research is understood and used in ways that uh, that is in line with what we had in mind. Because a lot of times we hear things like, 
yeah, well, you know, that's the engineer's problem or the, that's the policymaker's problem, or I'm just a researcher or I'm just an engineer, I'm just a scientist, or we didn't really consider that population or we didn't really consider that particular thing in our data, right? And so there's ways of like really um, evading responsibility that's been sort of normalized in our community if we're being very honest. And we've seen the harms of of doing that um, on on, peop on people, on vulnerable communities. And so we really have to kind of try to take responsibility from uh, for, for how some responsibility for how our work is understood and used. And the second thing is that it is very, very crucial to build partnerships that are based on mutual trust and, uh, and respect with domain experts in affected communities. And I, and I really mean both of these, I used to say just domain experts, but then I think people started to assume that I mean like experts in the traditional sense, trained in some other discipline, but I actually think of affected communities as also being experts, right? Their lived experiences are a sort of expertise that we can learn from as well. And so I think it's really important that we see that as a sort of very crucial uh, part of our kind of end-to-end -end process. And I'll give a shout out here to an initiative, Mechanism Designed for Social Good, that, uh, that I uh, co-founded and have been co-organizing that really model some of these things that I've mentioned to, to you that are very important to my research and also other people's research. And this initiative um, is, is focused on the use of uh, algorithmic optimization mechanism design techniques, but also uh, using those in conjunction with insights from other, other disciplines to improve access to opportunity for historically disadvantaged communities. So this is an initiative that I'm co-organizing with folks that you see here. I'll give a shout out to Irene Lowe, who is Australian. So uh, one, of, one of you all, um, and just really a wonderful person to work with and a, and a wonderful scholar. Uh, you should check out her work and also really at everyone that you see here, everyone here is just, um, uh, really been a pleasure to work with. And this uh, this initiative grew out of um, a reading group. It was an online reading group that we ran that started in fall of 2016. So it's been four years. I was co-organizing it at the time. I started in co-organizing it at the time with Kira Goldner, who was at University of Washington as a graduate student. I was at Cornell as a graduate student. Uh, Kira is now a postdoc at Columbia University. And this was an online reading group of mostly graduate students. It was junior led, and we were just trying to learn uh, from dis different disciplines and different domains to see where we can be useful uh, in conjunction with other disciplines to improve access to opportunity. And from that, you know, the group kind of grew uh, steadily. We were able to organize a technical workshop series that summer. So this was summer of 2017, about three and a half years ago. Uh, and this picture was taken at the very first uh, MD4SG workshop in 2017. It was like the first time that we were all in the same place. It was interesting uh, to do that after a year of like working together online. But since then, it's really expanded. Now we have something like 1,700 people on our email lists. There are over 100 institutions and 30 uh, uh, individuals from 100 institutions and 30 different countries that are engaged very actively in our workshop series, tutorial series, um, online working groups, um, online colloquium series that we run many, many different activities, right? So a lot of our activities happen online, uh, even before it was a necessity, but certainly now they all happen online. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. Uh, just to give just sort of one example, uh, we have sort of domain specific working groups now, kind of mirroring the original reading group that we had, but really diving in into a particular domain, like say housing and really trying to work with a multidisciplinary uh, group of researchers and practitioners really focused on that domain. And one shout out I want to give is just this fall, we started an Asia Pacific working group. So this is a working group that's, uh, that was started by Matt, who's been a, a fearless solo reader of this, free, of this working group. It's quite a bit of work. So he's really, um, he's, really, he's really been incredible in organizing it. It has, I think, 20 plus people uh, all across, I think mostly in Australia, but I think, you know, Asia Pacific more generally. And it's doing kind of... Um, something quite similar to what we did in our original working group where it's first just sort of exploring a lot of different domains, but the hope is that once there's like a huge presence of people that are interested in this uh, interface, then maybe it can kind of break off into different, uh, different, uh, uh, different domains that, that might be more, um, uh, that might be more interesting to people. So I encourage you to check that out. It's on the website. Also, if you're interested in joining or just learning more, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. 
And we also have a colloquium series that has hosted all, all different uh, types of researchers and practitioners, including uh, just to highlight two of them, uh, uh, Professor Al Roth, who is a Nobel Prize winner for his work on mechanism design for school choice and kidney exchange, among other things, was one of our speakers, Dr. Araba Say, who's an expert in uh, the ICTD community and uh, uh, sort of a senior researcher in um, Research ICT Africa was another speaker that we had last spring, but we, you know, it's a monthly co cam series. So there's many, many people here that are doing wonderful work. And uh, just to uh, just to kind of give you a sneak preview, we have a, a, the technical workshop, workshop series that we had has matured into a, a conference, an ECM conference series that will be starting in the fall of 2021. So September 2021, so fall in the US, uh, maybe spring, I guess, elsewhere. But this is uh, uh, likely September 2021, maybe August 2021. Um, very likely to be virtual, but if magically physical events are possible, then it'll be at Columbia University. And it's an opportunity to sort of submit work from many different disciplines to, uh, to kind of get feedback and be a part of the community. And so with that, I'll stop. I'll, I'll say that if you're interested in well, if you're interested in my research, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you're interested in MD4SG, you can uh, contact, well, you can contact me, but also you can contact just the, uh, uh, the whole MD4SG group and we'll be able to uh, tell you more about what we do. And uh, if you're interested in engaging, also uh, engage you in, in, any, in any way that uh, sort of makes sense for you. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.